any way our lives have been twisted by sin before we got, came to know you. We thank you for restoring our innocence, for bringing back that peace that you wanted us to have all along, but the devil tried to rob from us. And, and we say you are the God of the recompense and that we, uh, we live full lives because of you and you restore our innocence. Just say that with me. My innocence is restored in Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I'm going to cover a lot of ground, so I'm going to move kind of quickly. Take a look at one of those handouts that you got. It's got a picture of Einstein. It says some closing thoughts, but I'm going to make it some opening thoughts. Um, right um, next to that blackboard where it says e equals mc squared. You all got it? It says many victims repress all memory of sexual abuse. It's not uncommon, however, for these people to find themselves burden-bearing for other known victims and strongly identifying with their hurts. Others might begin to see images of events in bits and pieces, unaware that these might be actual memories of their own. In various dreams and daydreams, they may appear as a victim or their perpetrator may appear as a victimizer. So let me just pause there for a minute because this gets back to Psalm 139 that says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when we experience trauma, which sexual abuse is a horrendous form of trauma, our bodies have to cope and we still have to get up the next day and, and focus and do the work that we're required. If you listen to Joyce Meyer, she described that in her own life, that there wasn't a day that she wasn't afraid of her dad coming in her room. But you still have to get up. You still have to go to school. You still have to do your homework. You have to work. All the, all the things that life requires. So we car compartmentalize the trauma in our brain and put it over here and try to keep going. And we repress it. That's what that opening sentence means. Many victims repress all memory of sexual abuse. But then they find themselves being attracted to want to help other people who've been hurt. And then it says that sometimes in various dreams or daydreams, they may see themselves appear as a victim. And that could be the Holy Spirit stirring things up inside of us and saying it's, it's time for us to get healed now, okay? It's time for us to work on this thing because you're strong enough to be able to handle it and because you're going to experience pain either way. If you don't do anything about it, you'll have to live with the continuing pain. If you want to do something about it, you'll have to walk through pain, but you'll walk out whole on the other side. Because the walking through the pain of having to relive some of these things, and frankly, to forgive somebody that hurt you. Again, if you saw the Joyce Meyer, uh, anybody who's watching it doesn't know what we're talking about. It's called One Life. It's her testimony of what happened between her and her father and how this amazing completion of redemption where she actually led her father to the Lord um, who was a victimizer of hers multiple can't even say how many times and at first she said if you really love me God you'd never be asking me to do this right but we know it's because he loves us that he does ask us to do it because if we don't forgive people then we're the ones that are swallowing the poison right so it's, it's a tough situation. Nobody would ever ask to be put in that situation. But if you remember, she said, I can actually stand here and tell you all that I'm a better person for what happened to me. That's really hard to grasp, isn't it? And, you know, that, that may be a real 360 and a full circle. But it's, it's because of what we said earlier. It's what Joseph said to his brothers. What you meant for evil when you sold me into slavery, God meant for life. He had a plan that life would be saved by your plan to destroy a life. He had a different plan. And you might think I'm going to try to destroy you, but I'm not. Because if I hated what you did to me, why would I want to become the very thing I hated? <laughs> Forgiveness. It's a miracle. It's supernatural to be able to do it. But if we don't do it, we suffer. So... It's a really difficult choice, but we have to make that choice. Amen. So I'm going to uh, go through some of these uh, slides that are summaries of the things that the Sanford said and remind you on that next one, Amaris, that we're, we're covering a, a chapter in the book, Growing Paints, chapter 8. This is where the Sanford's material is covered, uh, their, their new version. Our class is called Possessing Your Vessel, which is the next slide. It's taken from 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and 4. It says, for this is the will of God, say it with me, your 
sanctification, okay? That means a cleansing process, a holiness. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're called and set apart for the work of the Lord. Regardless of what happened to us prior, he still calls us holy. When we're adopted into his family, we, we get our innocence restored. Now we have to maintain that walk with him, right? That, that process of transformation and sanctification is ongoing, and he'll continually show us ways that we can be transformed ever closer into his image, right? That's not something to be discouraged about. That's, that's something to be excited about, because as good as you feel right now, you could even get closer to him by becoming transformed more like his image. So it says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Not just sexual immorality, but that's the example Paul is using in this case where we lose our sanctification is when we delve into areas that God never meant us to go, right? Sexual intercourse is meant for two people that have already made a lifetime commitment to each other called a covenant in God's eyes, okay? And when we open that, outside of that covenant, there's all kinds of pain and all kinds of sorrow. And this has been going on for thousands of years, and people still think they can do it their way and not suffer the consequences. So much better to just recognize, I'm going to do it your way, God. I don't fully understand all these things. I do get tempted sometimes, but if you said you always make a way for me to escape, no matter what situation I'm in, you'll provide me with the strength to get out of it. Joseph fled. He left his jacket behind, right? Flee sexual immorality. Fight for your altar, right? That's what we've been talking about week after week after week. There's a war for your altar. The devil wants you to violate that holiness and that sanctification because then he can bring that shame in there. And sometimes it's just, why bother trying? I've already lost my innocence, so I'm just going to throw all of this to the wind. Exactly what the devil would want, right? That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in honor and sanctification. And then the next verse in the Passion says, each of you must guard your sexual purity with holiness and dignity, not yielding to lustful passions like those who don't know God. Never take selfish advantage of a brother or sister in this matter. For we've already told you and solemnly warned you that the Lord is the avenger in all these things. Not always evident that he's avenging the situation. Seems like people are getting away with it, but they're not. Their conscience has, may have been seared with a hot iron, but deep down they know that they violated somebody. Again, Joyce Meyer's story, her father was crying for three weeks, and her mother called and said, you better come over here. He's been crying for th three weeks, and he wants to talk to you. Do you remember this part? And, and when she got there, he said, I have to apologize. I'm so sorry for the way I treated you. It took a long time of her showing love and kindness to melt that outer exterior, that callus and scar tissue. He was a wounded guy. That's what happens, right? Hurt people hurt other people. And she had to forgive him. Well, she didn't have to, actually, but she chose to. And we're all the better for it, for the example that she set. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 and 16 should one presume to take the members of Christ's body and make them member, I'm sorry, make them into members of a harlot? Absolutely not. Aren't you aware of the fact that when anyone sleeps with a prostitute, he becomes a part of her and she becomes a part of him? Now, I'll just expand that to say anytime there's sexual intercourse outside of the covenant of a marriage between a man and a woman, I have to say that these days, there's a violation. Okay, And what he's saying here is to become one in that transaction. It's not understood by the world, is it? It seems like just another act of the flesh. It's not. There's a spiritual exchange that happens that we call soul ties. Okay? Soul ties is not a biblical phrase, but it's described in detail right here. To become one. How many songs on the radio in the last, I don't know, if they had a radio in Egypt, they'd still be singing about their heart being broken over a broken relationship with somebody. Why? Because you fragment off. And when that person leaves you, part of you goes with them. And you're really feeling a broken heart, aren't you? Those of you that had to live through that trauma and that pain. All those country songs aren't wrong. They're moaning and calling it singing because they lost their baby. <laughs> it's never the person who broke up with the one who's crying, is it? It's the one who got broken off.
because there's a literal breaking in our spirit. And now when you multiply this by multiple partners, there's a fragment left all over the place of your heart. And it's like God putting Humpty Dumpty back together again when we get saved and we repent for each one that we can even remember because some of us live decadent lifestyles and we were doing drugs and there were all kinds of really decadent things going on. God doesn't hold that against you, but we have to ask him, bring those fragments back in and put me back together again, Lord. He wants to do that. Of course he does. He's not going to punish you if you don't remember somebody's name. You just come with a repentant heart and say, I didn't know any better. I was playing the game by the rules the world taught me. I didn't know there was another way to play the game. Now I do, and I repent, Lord. Please forgive me. Does he? Of course he does. He's close to those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And once we recognize that defilement, it's almost hard to believe that he would forgive us, and yet he does. You need to. Remember, and I'm going to also say this, another class that will talk about spiritual adultery. Physical adultery never happens unless there's first spiritual adultery. So you could see it coming if you're looking for it. And don't say love is blind, okay? It's not love, it's lust. <laughs> okay. Look, I don't want to go off on too much of these kinds of sayings other than to say we have to possess our vessel. We have to live sanctified lives. That will cause you to flourish and prosper. You can be forgiven. When we make mistakes, of course, there's forgiveness available. But there's also pain. And there's also death that comes. The, the wages of sin is death. And doesn't mean it can't be restored again. But avoid all of that. All right. So this is from Healing the Wounded Spirit, one of the earlier books by John and Paul Sanford. This is their quote. Sexual abuse, we believe, is the most damaging of all abuse. Let that settle in for a minute, OK? That means fear. That means living with somebody who's insane, who's threatening you, who's holding a gun to your head, who's beating you with an aluminum baseball bat. Sexual abuse is worse than those because it gets right down into the wiring of our lives. Okay? It's a violation at the deepest level that somebody can experience it, men and women, right? Because we typically think of the man as the abuser, but men have been sexually abused as well. And it's just such a sick world. And because when something becomes more normalized, they have to go further. And it's got to get worse because in order to satisfy that lust, it's, it's like, well, this doesn't satisfy me anymore because I've already done that, so now I have to do something worse. It's that you sow the wind and you reap the whirlwind. It's this law of increase, good and bad. The blessings come greater, but also people are less and less satisfied, so they do just sicker and sicker things. Right now, I'm not trying to glamorize the devil in any way. I'm just saying, they're saying a really important thing here. Sexual abuse, we believe, is the most damaging of all abuse. So it doesn't mean it's the hardest thing to get healed from, but it does mean it may take a little while. There may be layers that have to be peeled off. There may be only certain memories that are coming back in the beginning, and you shouldn't beat yourself up if it's not happening fast enough. If you're in the process, God will work with you, will work with you. The people here that love you have no agenda other than to see you walking in wholeness. And you'll be chugging along feeling like you're not making much progress, and then all of a sudden a light goes off. And it's like you get catapulted up to a whole other level of revelation and understanding and healing. And it's amazing. So hang in there. Don't, don't try to put a clock on it. All right, I'm going to read a little bit more. It says, that's because the body was built to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. This is why it's such a severe sin. And it's, our body was meant to be shared with a mate in sanctification and honor, not in lust, like we just read. Joining to another in sexual embrace is never a physical union only. It involves our whole person. It's impossible to touch body only because it's the spirit living in every cell which gives life to the body. In the marriage relationship, we're designed to become one flesh in blessedness as God ordained. That is the blessed relationship that God designed for us. That's why we don't want to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever in marriage. We want to have the same basis for reconciling our differences and coming together and saying, no, the devil is not going to get a foothold. He's not going to put a wedge between us. We will reconcile. We're in covenant. We are going to make this relationship work no matter what. Divorce is not a word in our dictionary. 
That's how you should feel with your wife and your husband, okay? We are going to make this thing work. The Lord wants it to work, and we're going to make it work regardless of our differences. You'll finally realize I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> That's how most people feel anyway, even if they may not say it. <laughs> All right. To come together in any other way is defilement, okay? Now, the world doesn't want to hear that. College kids don't want to hear this. They want to be able to live together. There's so many justifications. Even the secular psychologists will tell you all the statistics say people who live together divorce at a higher rate than those that get married. When they do get married later, they end up divorcing. They, it's not benefiting you to live together first. Again, another big subject that I won't go too far. A woman is described as a deep well. This is in Proverbs 6, 16. A woman is described as a deep well of refreshment for her man. A man who drinks from a well which is not his not only violates and uses the woman, he defrauds the brother who will become her future husband. Wholesome sexual relationship in the sanctity of marriage strengthens personal identification in the sense of being chosen and cherished, belonging and resting where God has called us to be. Now, I've said it before, I'll say it here in the context here. When I met Trisha, I knew she loved God more than me. She knew that I loved her more, I loved him more than her, sorry. <laughs> and she wanted it that way, and so did I. It was the days before cell phones, okay? So if I was, come, if I was late coming home from work because I worked in New York City, she wasn't worried that I stopped in a motel somewhere because she knew I had a fear of the Lord. I knew she had a fear of the Lord. We held each other accountable. We were asking each other, what did the Lord show you today when you read the Bible? It's a great way to live. I could still remember pulling over one time on Route 3 when they had the uh, pay phones that were at the level of your car window, like you could pull up and, and it was like right here. And it was a freezing, slushy day. And as I rolled down the window to, to dial the phone, a truck came by and hit the, hit the puddle that was right next to the car. And the whole car got filled with slush. It's like, this is how much I love my wife to call her, to tell her why I'm running home late. Now it's in our phone, it's in our pocket. You just tell Siri to call, right? But, but when you're living with that, that lack of trust, you really can't feel like two have become one because you're worried. And that worry just eats away at you. It's not God's plan. The plan is one person, one man and one woman together for life, covenant relationship. Oh, but I made a mistake. No, God will make a way where you don't think there is a way. You want that other person to change? Let them see a change in you. <laughs> Selah. <laughs> I'll keep going. This is from 2 Samuel 13. I'm giving you a truncated version of the story. It says, David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar. Amnon, her half-brother, fell desperately in lust, we could say, right? He says desperately in love here with her. Amnon became so obsessed with Tamar that he became ill. Ladies, if somebody is obsessed with you, that's a big red flag. Their relationship with the Lord is out of kilter. If they're obsessed with you, you would want them to be obsessed with God. <laughs> it's got to be a healthy relationship. Okay, I could just go off here and I'm not. Huh. He became so obsessed with Tamar that he became ill. She was a virgin and Amnon thought he could never have her. So in verse 5, Jonadab, one of his friends, said, I'll tell you what to do. Go back to bed and pretend you're ill. When your father comes to see you, ask him to let Tamar come and prepare some food for you. Tell him you'll feel better if she prepares it as you watch and feeds you with her own hands. Shouldn't that have been a red flag for somebody? What do you mean, I'll feel better if she's the one feeding me? There's a wrong snake in the garden here, isn't there? And, and that's where that discernment really needs to kick in. All right. I'm married to Trish. Don't forget. Super high discernment. Verse 8. When Tamar arrived at, at Amnon's house, she went to the place where he was lying down so she could, I'm sorry, so he could watch her mix some dough. Then she baked his favorite dish for him. But when she set the serving tray before him, he refused to eat and told everyone, get out of here. So they all left, and then he said to Tamar, now bring the food into my bedroom and feed it to me here. So she took his favorite dish to him, but as she was feeding him, he grabbed her and demanded, come to bed with me, my darling sister. Yeah, darling sister. 
No, my brother, she cried. Don't be foolish. Don't do this thing to me. Such wicked things aren't done in Israel. Where could I go in my shame? And you would be called one of the greatest fools in Israel. Here we are thousands of years later, and we're saying that about him. Please, just speak to the king about it, and he will let you marry me. Aren't you glad that rule changed, ladies? Nobody would think of saying that today, would they? Since he was stronger than she was, he raped her. And then suddenly Amnon's, Amnon's love turned to hate, and he hated her even more than he had loved her. Wait a minute, he was obsessed with her. Now all of a sudden, that snake in his heart and in his spirit turned on him, which the devil always does. He's a mean boss. He's a liar. He comes as the father of light, and then he turns on you, and he bankrupts your soul. And he tells her, get out of here. No, she cried. Sending me away now is worse than what you've already done to me. And I can't go into the long version of the story, but you sure can read this, okay? It's a disaster. What happens after this is a disaster. Absalom takes vengeance against Amnon. He has his brother killed. It's, it's right out of a, a, a bad movie. And then Absalom ends up dying, right? So just death and destruction because of sin. Now, you could pull back and see, I wonder if because David never conquered his lust problem, it came down into his children. That's a very fair question for another day, but it's worth thinking about, right? Because when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when sin is allowed to continue, it ripples down. And we know what happened with Solomon, another one of his sons. Big problem. So... Selah on that one. All right, so this is another statement by the Sanford. Sexual abuse confuses identity, plants fear of being chosen, offers no promise of being cherished, and makes a girl wonder how God could allow such a horrible thing to happen. We could spend the whole night just on that one paragraph, couldn't we? I, I, I can't do it because of what we want to get done tonight, because we want to pray. But... Each one of these sentences is worth thinking about. And I send you the slides, right? So you can all just dig into this deeper after the class. But my identity gets confused because I got violated at the deepest level of what can happen to me, man or woman. It doesn't matter who gets violated. There's a confusion that happens about my identity. And I offer no promise of being cherished. So now that I feel like I've lost that and I've been spoiled, I can't ever regain it. But God... Okay, that's how our innocence can be restored. And it might sound like, you know, second prize. No, he restores our innocence. Okay, he restores it in a way that's supernatural. And, and you'll hear testimonies from people. And Joyce Myers effectively said that in her testimony as well. We just have to take that by faith. Okay, now it goes into this other part. The majority of parents who batter and abuse their helpless children or molest them sexually or simply deprive them of sustenance and do not know um, or are not able to admit that they need help. Now, that's, that's a really hard sentence to swallow there, right? Because if you think of somebody abusing a child and that's not something you've ever experienced or you don't think could ever cross your mind, where we have to step back and say, wait a minute, hurt people hurt people. Most of the time, if they're doing that to somebody else, it's been done to them. And there's been such a scrambling of the wiring. It's like going fishing and the, and the, the reel gets all tangled up and, and their insides is like that knot. And that's why I love that verse. It says, he makes the crooked way straight. So no way are we justifying what they've done. But the only way you could forgive them is to realize that the pain inside of them must be worse than the pain they've inflicted on me. Who would ever do that to their child? You wouldn't bring a child into the world and then abuse them like that. So they just don't see that they need help or they're not able to admit that they need help. Clearly her father in Joyce Meyer's case was in that camp, he couldn't admit it. But enough love from her, isn't that amazing? How love from Joyce, the one who was wounded, melted his hard heart and caused him to want to repent and apologize to her. That's God's formula. If somehow these parents are accused of maltreatment, they deny it. The few who do not want aid frequently don't know where to find it. I'm sorry. The few who do want aid frequently don't know where to find it. And what are we going to do tonight? Like, we don't have a long time to be together. I gave you a lot to read. 
I'm extending this another week, just so you know. I'm pulling executive privilege here and talked to the pastor, and he said I could do another week. It's too big a topic. I just couldn't, I didn't feel like we could really do it justice and, and help people the way we want to help them when it's such a deep and difficult subject. So you can kind of breathe a sigh of relief that we have a little time. We'll, have, we'll pray tonight when we're done. But you might say, well, I didn't really experience this. But so many people have, and every year the numbers get higher of how many people have suffered this. So just as a minister of reconciliation in the body of Christ, the more we know about this, the more the Lord is revealing to us the rules of engagement, of how this works, and, and just how dangerous it is to ever even think about getting close to that line of spiritual adultery, like flirting, forget it, being alone with somebody in a car of the opposite sex that's not your mother <laughs> or father, that, that, that you feel safe with, you're setting yourself up for a potential problem. Okay, two people alone, you could be accused of things that aren't true, but it's just one word against another. So protect yourself, guard your heart. Don't put yourself in a place where you can fall into temptation. Know where your weaknesses are and don't put yourself in that place, okay? Sorry if I'm preaching. <laughs> it says far too often those who are asked to help don't know how to provide it. So that was my setup, see? Like, what's what we're trying to do? Even if you haven't dealt with this, you don't need the healing yourself. People don't know where to find it. You could be part of that help. doesn't mean you're a professional licensed counselor, but it means that you're a member of the body of Christ. You're filled with the Spirit of God. You're attending a church where there are people that are very qualified to help. And then there's professional help that, that can be given. We don't bill anybody for what we do here. It's just biblical ministry. We provide counseling. There's no charge for that. But there are plenty of people that we know if what of what we can do is below what's needed, then we can refer to other Christians. And look, for us, it has to be Christian, okay? Christian counselors, Christian psychiatrists, Christian psychologists, they've got to see the healing through this lens, okay? Not through the secular lens, in our opinion. All right, it says, even the experts disagree on how best to treat the offenders. Now, that's another whole thing. Because if we don't treat the offender, he or she could just keep repeating that problem, right? So we should be just as concerned about the person who's committing the crime. But that turns your stomach to think about that, doesn't it? One of the articles I gave you, we're not going to read it tonight, but I'd like you to read it. It's not easy to read. And somebody said to me, watching the Joyce Meyer video wasn't that easy either. But I want you to read this. This was just something I read in the New York Times many years ago. Um, and I want to talk about it next week. It's about... Uh, Sex trafficking, and how would you minister to the girl who, who got rescued out of it is one question. How would you minister to the guy who was doing it, who was running the sex trafficking? Is he worth praying for? Absolutely. Does God want to save that guy? But would we know what to say? Or would we be so turned off and so disgusted by what this person did that we wouldn't even have enough Mercy to say, you know what? God wants to save you too. And by the way, if God saves that guy, that, that eliminates the whole domino effect after. This is really a powerful article. So read that on, uh, during the week when, when you're feeling brave. It says, less is known and less is done about helping the victims, which is amazing because there's so many victims. God is revealing to the church the way of healing. He's purging our hearts and calling us to be a shelter and a refuge and protection from the storm. Isaiah chapter 4. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's what we sang tonight, right? I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Keep saying it. Keep repeating it. It's the decade of the decree. There's something about you saying it with your voice and your mouth and it coming out of your spirit. I am chosen, not forsaken. Keep saying it. It, it pounds down the opposition of the enemy's lies and allows that truth to settle in your heart. It says he is purging our hearts and calling us to be a shelter and a refuge and protection. That's other people can be protected by us because we have authority if we've been healed of something. How powerful is Joyce Meyer to minister to somebody who's had this problem? She's been healed of it. It's not out of a book. 
And then the Spirit bears witness that we are God's children. And then next one says, Matthew 18, 14. It's not the will of your Father who's in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. All right? So especially if children are being abused, mind-boggling to us sometimes how that could ever happen. But yet they're resilient. It's amazing how resilient children are and how they can bounce back from terrible trauma if given the right care. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it's better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depth of the sea. Same chapter. And again, same chapter. See that you don't despise one of these little ones. For I say, there are angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who's in heaven. So you know, over and over we read about the injustice against the widow and the orphan in the Bible, right? And how God's heart bleeds for people who can't defend themselves. And what we do as the church is give a voice to the oppressed and to people who don't have a voice. And, and why he hates the fact that people would take advantage, like that man Amnon would take advantage of his stepsister, or not stepsister, half-sister, I guess it was, right? God hates that. He's a God of justice. You don't have to take the vengeance. Don't get tangled up in wanting to take vengeance and, and, and getting joy out of that fact of thinking that you're going to see that person that hurt you be hurt themselves. That's the devil's trick. Okay, you with me? You don't look too happy out there, so humor me. <laughs> Isaiah 40, 11 says, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. That's us. In his arm, he will gather his lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing lambs, is, is another word for that. Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, Jesus said. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but the one who sent me. It's clear that the Lord is intensely concerned for the sake of his children. How then do we minister to the lost and abused and wounded lambs in the name of Jesus? Big part of what we're asking you to do is open up your heart and don't leave it up to somebody else to do it, okay? Give me one second. I'm sorry. Give me a second. Okay. My bad. Missing something. All right. So this is the Sanfords now. You may or may not know what I'm about to read for you. It says, we know that in God there's power to forgive and be forgiven, to change, to grow, and to overcome. Over the course of their ministry, with about 40 years that they ran a counseling ministry, which is still in operation even though they're gone. Uh, they're home with the Lord now. So we're talking about thousands and tens of thousands of hours in the counseling room and training people and the staff there. Uh, they know, they're saying this with high conviction, that in God there's power to forgive and be forgiven, change, grow, and overcome. Until last year, they said... We would have declared this by faith to those who were wounded by abuse from our relatively safe position as counselors. Today, having lost a beloved son-in-law who molested one of his own children, that's their grandchild. We've personally experienced the pain and struggle that beset many of you. Okay, so here, how ironic, right? They knew all the things to do to help prevent this from happening, and it still happened right in their own family. So they then had to start to practice with their son-in-law what they were telling everybody else they had to do. Now, God's not in that. Like, he's not purposely trying to dangle it in front of you. But he's saying, look, it's like Corey Ten Boom having to, she preaches about forgiveness, and then the prison guard that was in her camp comes up and says, will you forgive me? <laughs> oh, Really? It's not just theory anymore. It's practice. Huh. So they lost you know, their son-in-law who molested one of his own children, and we have personally experienced that pain. And we say to you with more conviction than ever before, they go on to say that God loves all of us unconditionally, and he calls us to love one another and minister to one another with that same love. You wouldn't know this, but I remember reading it that their son-in-law went to prison and then came out of prison and was living in the town. And John Sanford used to take him out for coffee on Saturday mornings and try to minister healing to him. And it would have been very easy to say, that's not my job. I'm going to leave that up to somebody else. Joyce Meyer could have said that about her father, right? Some of you are looking at me like, I hope he doesn't ask me to do that. <laughs> It's very difficult for the one who's been deeply wounded by abuse to understand that forgiveness, what? Must be extended. All right, this is not an option. It's, it's a really hard reality, but it must be. 
extended. It seems that the abuser deserves to be punished. In the victim's helplessness, the hate, anger, and resentment may have seemed to be the only means of retaliation. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be best friends with the person who hurt you, okay? That's where it gets a little confusing to people. Well, if I forgive them, am I saying that what they did was not a problem? Not at all. Not at all. Do we have to have dinner together? No. Okay? Should you feel sick when you see them? No. Right? I mean, that wouldn't be God's perfect plan. When you really forgive them, you accomplish that forgiveness, and you're able to hand them over to the Lord and say, this is your child. He needs healing. She needs healing. If there's something I could do to help that process, I want to be part of it. But I think it's more than what I can just do alone. I'll do my part. But I hope they have a revival in their lives because they are a mess if they could have done that to me. Has to be extended. All right. An effective way to begin then is first to empathize. <sighs> so hard, right? How do I empathize with somebody who did something that I don't think I could have ever done? Can I be honest? You can't say I would have never done something because you don't know the pain the person was in that did what they did. You've had a different life than they've had. We've all had very different lives, and I don't mean to be flip about this. It's not excusing what they did, but that's just another fact that if you were in Germany when Hitler took over, the odds that you would have helped the Germans put the Jews in the prison camp are much higher than you would have been Schindler. <laughs> Sorry, hate to break the news. It's just life. We all believe that we would be Schindler, but the reality is that people look the other way, and they just can't muster the courage to do it, right? And, and this is just why God hates injustice so much, because the bullies are tyrants, and they rule by that tyrannical rule. Okay, I'm not meaning to, you know, say I'm never going back to that church again. I'm not, I'm not meaning to say anything other than, if you think you could never do something, be careful. The capacity in our humanity is there to do really evil things. We don't want to believe that we would ever do them, but could we? Yes. So should we start this conversation about having empathy for the person who hurt me? Yes. Go into the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. And what did he do? He identified with the sin of humanity. He had to look across that prayer garden and look at us and say, if I were you, I could have done what you did. So I'm going to surrender my life for yours. So you get in your garden with the person who hurt you, and you say, I'm choosing now as an act of my will to forgive you, clean the slate, and let you go of the pain that you caused me. I'm wanting retribution for that. I'm giving you to God, and I'm praying for a revival in your life so that the, the twisted part of your life will get healed and changed. Do I hope you come back and apologize? Yes. My forgiveness is not contingent on that, though. It's a tough one, isn't it? All right. So the first way to begin is to empathize. Then to explain that anger, hate, and resentment held in our hearts work inside us like a poisonous substance, okay? So what he's saying is if we're in a position to talk, some, talk to somebody who's been in an abusive situation and been abused, we have to try to help convince them that their current condition is not the optimum one that God wants for them. Holding on to this hatred is acting like a poison in their system. If allowed to remain, they'll sicken not only our hearts and our minds and our spirits, but they affect our physical health as well because of the tension that they create. And in Psalm 32, 3, it says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. We thereby lose peace, joy, and the ability to expect and receive kindness from those who are prepared to give it. Can you think about this for a minute? What happens when you get numb? Or if you've ever been in a traumatic situation, you know that expression, shell-shocked? That goes back to World War I when the, when the soldiers would come home. It's a physical condition. They were being shelled. There were bombs going off all around them, and they survived, but they were so traumatized that they were physically here, but they weren't 100% emotionally here because they were in shock. And that happens to us in different stages. God can heal it. God wants to heal that. But if we hold on to unforgiveness, it's allowing that thing to have a home to harbor in. So it can affect our physical presence. I just want to read it again. 
We lose peace. We lose joy. The ability to expect and receive kindness from those who are prepared to give it. We're, we're like semi-zombies. We're walking around. We're going through the motions. We're physically there, but we're not all emotionally engaged because we can't get it out of our mind what happened to us. Uh, there's a movie called American Sniper, and he's coming back and forth. He's coming out of the battlefield in Afghanistan, and he's coming home to family picnics with no debriefing process, no counselor. And one day, there's one scene in the movie where he's sitting in the living room staring at the TV, but the TV's not on. And everybody in the family's out in the backyard having a, you know, picnic, and he's just shell-shocked. And he walks out in the backyard, and he sees a kid getting rough with a dog, and he thinks the dog's going to hurt the kid, and he shifts into this mode. He gets triggered, and he shifts back into battlefield mode. He's ready to kill the dog. Involuntary reaction. I think I told you I saw Marcus Luttrell, the Navy SEAL, lone survivor, we're in a conference center in a big hotel, and he walks in with a golden retriever. I didn't even get it at the time. Now I understand. The dog was there with him in case he got triggered. He could have been walking down the street, and a, a car could have backfired, and he could have thought it was a gunshot, and he'd get triggered. Now, the dog is so sensitively trained that it can tell if he shifts into that mode because we emote certain kind of stress hormones. And the dog's trained to start licking his hand and jumping up on him to say, snap out of it. This isn't real, what you're going through. Can you imagine? And we're supposed to identify with that person, even though we have never had anything close to that happen in our lives. Yes. Why? Because God loves that person, wants them healed. So he will allow you to feel it if you'll allow him to let you feel it. Not so easy, is it? Can't somebody else do that? Trisha's really good at this. Can't we call her? She is, by the way. If hate is allowed to remain and grow, it will someday be out of control. We'll find ourselves hurting someone else in the same way that we were hurt. At this point, it's often possible to begin to talk somewhat about how the abuser would not have done what he did had it he not or she not been wounded themselves. If the wounded one can make an identification with the woundedness of the abuser, then some basis for compassion may be laid which more easily allows forgiveness to occur. God will deal with those who sin against us. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord, Romans 12, 19. Obviously, forgiveness is not easy. It's not something we can, this is really powerful. Just take a look at this one, okay? It's not something we can accomplish you can't accomplish forgiveness by an act of your will, but you can choose by an act of your will to forgive. And that's right back to Corey Ten Boom. That's exactly how she said it. Here I am standing. I see the prison guard from the camp walking up the aisle. He doesn't recognize me, but I recognize him. And I say to the Lord, how am I going to do this? I can't make a choice to forgive. I can't forgive him in my own strength, but I can choose to extend my hand, and you can fill me with the ability to forgive him. <laughs> oh my God, read that book. And then it says, uh, all right, we can choose by an act of our will to forgive, and we can choose for him to make us willing. <laughs> That's spoken like a real counselor. You see it? We can't accomplish forgiveness by an act of our will, but we can choose by an act of our will to forgive, and then we can choose to allow him to make us willing. <laughs> That's decades of counseling right there, summed up. We'll probably need to, need to make that choice again and again. In the process, the Lord himself will cause it to become real in our hearts because we are no longer willfully hanging on to the right to hate somebody. And this is where we talk about layers of the onion getting peeled back and stages of healing that happen. And I think if you think about it in the extreme, if somebody had such a traumatic life, it's not always the case that they're going to be able to handle all those memories in a short place. Sometimes God can just supernaturally do it. Other times it's paced. And, and we work with the Lord in the pacing, and we pray, and we fast, and we intercede, and we ask him for the clues and, and where the stumbling blocks might be. But we trust him in the process for the healing, okay? And we don't feel like we have to rush him. He's not looking to cause us to suffer any longer than necessary. It's not that. 
It's like if somebody needs a heart operation, but their blood pressure is too high, you have to wait until this part gets down. You've got to get the blood pressure down before they can handle the operation. And that's how our emotions are. They can be pretty fragile. So he'll build it back to the extent that we're willing to allow him to. Hope I don't sound like I'm trying to practice medicine without a license. <laughs> but here, I just wanted to focus. We'll probably need to make that choice again and again, okay? Until it's accomplished, we have forgiven the person to a certain level, but it's not fully accomplished. So that's part of the choice. I choose to be willing, Lord. I choose to let you work through me so that I can forgive this person. You okay with a case study? I'm just going to give you a summary of it. This one with the staple in it, you can read that. That's the full version. I found this very helpful to illustrate what happens, not just to the person. Actually, it's not much about the actual girl, Karen, who was abused. It's about the influence on the family and what a ripple effect there is and how we have to consider everybody when we're talking about trying to bring healing into a situation. It says, Bill and Linda's 14-year-old daughter, Karen, had who had always been a responsible, sensitive, loving child and a good student, began to exhibit rebellious, irresponsible behavior. What's that? That's just having your eyes open and being alert to what's going on. And if you see a change in the pattern of your child and there's no obvious reason for it, there may be a spiritual cause. Okay, now this girl, Karen, is 14 years old. She's always been a responsible, sensitive, loving child. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she starts to exhibit rebellious and irresponsible behavior. Truancy and unexplained absences from home grew in frequency. Often, Linda would arrive home, that's the mom, from work to discover that Karen, her daughter, was nowhere to be found. And attempts to enforce discipline elicited angry, defensive outbursts. Think back to Joyce Meyer's story. How many excuses would you come up with not to go home from school if you were Joyce, thinking that your father might be home? You don't want to go home. You want to hide from the guy. What a horrible way to live. The person who brought you into the world, who you're supposed to be able to look to for safety and protection and nurture and covering, you're afraid of him to violate you. Think about it when it's somebody in the ministry where that person's representing God. And not only are they not protecting you, they're violating you. I mean, that's like a judge, you know, being on the take, right? That's somebody who's called to enforce the rules is violating the rules. Could God heal it? Absolutely. But when it's apparent, it's just the violation and the betrayal is off the charts. So truancy and unexplained absences from home grew in frequency. Often Linda would arrive home from work. Karen was nowhere to be found. Attempts to enforce discipline elicited angry, defensive outbursts from Karen. When anyone invited Karen to talk about her problems, she defiantly rejected every attempt to reach her and retreated into sullen moodiness. Finally, and with great difficulty, she came to her mother with a horrible story of sexual abuse. Her father had been molesting her since the time of her parents' separation which meant that she had been, was being abused all during the time of their counseling and reconciliation. So this man had already been identified as somebody who was uh, abusing sexually, was forced to separate, went through counseling, but during that time, he was still violating his 14-year-old daughter. And the mother didn't know it. So think of the ripple effect now. You're the mom. What are you thinking about yourself? I didn't protect my daughter. I should have seen it. Right now, all of a sudden, here comes another domino effect. Not just the daughter who's being violated. Now the mom is like, oh, my God, I'm a terrible mother if, if I let that happen. Doesn't mean she is a terrible mother, is, does it? It's so diabolical how the devil will operate in people. Shattered, torn, fearful, and confused, Linda confronted her husband. Bill adamantly denied all accusations. This is after having a track record of doing these things, so it's not like there wasn't a pattern prior. Adamantly denied all accusations, claiming that Karen's imagination was running away with her. You think this might have been why she was a little reluctant to talk about it in the first place? If, if you're the 14-year-old, this could really backfire on me. 
father said that she had been unduly influenced by the stories of friends who had been accused. He went on dramatically playing the role of the injured party. Linda didn't know whom or what to believe. So this is the wife, and she doesn't know whether to believe her husband, who's got a track record of this, or her 14-year-old daughter, who's acting very out of character. Finally, after repeated questioning, he confessed to having touched her, quote unquote, once or twice. I have to be careful what I say here, but you know that's a sign that there's probably more to follow, right? As Karen's behavior progressed more and more to the extreme, however, it became evident that he was guilty of much more than he had been willing to confess. And then I cut out a bunch of it. You could read it. I think it's worth reading because it really helps you understand the impact and, and have sensitivity around everybody that's involved. Yes, of course, the person who's being abused, but the siblings, the mom, it ripples. All right, so today Bill is receiving counsel for sexual rehabilitation. That's when this article was written. While serving a term in prison, he and Linda are divorced. She and the children have rebonded, and the Lord is blessing and redeeming their lives as only he can. All right, now, that may sound like faint praise, but without God, there's very little hope, right? There's just drugs to, to medicate your pain, but that ability to forgive has to be supernatural. It, it's got to be understood as the rules of engagement in the kingdom, that you don't fight fire with fire. You don't fight hate with more hate you are the one that ends up holding on to that thing. So what can we say? Anybody who's suffering from this problem, we try to work with them and let them vent their anger, of course, but ultimately get to the point where you have to realize that holding on to it is worse than letting go of it and being able to forgive that person and know that you'll be protected from that person. We're not saying let them back into your life in a way that would create vulnerability, right? Where you could be exposed to harm. So Psalm 55 is, is really key. It's David pouring out his heart about being betrayed. And that's this is a betrayal at the deepest level, what we're talking about. He's not necessarily talking about sexual violation, but he's talking about betrayal. He says, my heart is severely pained within me, Psalm 55, verse 4, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Right? You get that feeling, don't you? Of when things are so confusing, it's like, man, I just wish I had wings and I could get out of here. I suffered a terrible trauma in my life. Not a sexual violation, but a lot of you know the story of a murder in my family. And... Uh, it happened to be right at Christmas, and there was a song on the radio, and it was Joni Mitchell, and she was saying, I wish I had a river to skate away on. I don't know if you remember it, but man, that's it. that had to be the song. And John Leonard had been killed just a few weeks before that. Unbelievable confluence of events of, that could lead you to depression if you don't know the Lord, and I didn't know the Lord. So I have no tools to pull from. You wish you had a river to skate away on? Yeah, me too. And you're not feeling, you know, nobody's give. The world doesn't know how to talk about this. So they don't say anything. So I guess that's the right answer? No. <laughs> grief counseling? Never heard of it. Nobody ever said that, those two words, grief counseling. What a great idea. Didn't know about it. All right, thank God for him. <laughs> Verse 12, it's not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it, nor it is the one who hates me has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him, but it was you. This girl could say, my father. David's saying, a man my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng, but I call to God and the Lord saves me. Say that with me, all right? But I call to God and the Lord saves it. You gotta believe that. That's our answer. It's not pills, right? And I'm not saying that people shouldn't take medication. I, I would never say that. I hope though, that we don't think that's the final answer. 
It's a bridge to get us somewhere. It's a bridge to get us to healing, right? Okay, so I want to be clear about that. Verse 17, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. And this is worth remembering this verse. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle that's waged against me, even though many oppose me. I think that one's worth repeating, okay? Ready. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. That's by faith. Okay, because how could you say you were unharmed? But when you come through what Joyce Myers did and you come out the other side healed, you could say, was I harmed? Yes. Am I harmed now? No. I'm healed now. I'm walking in the fullness that God has for me. And I am rubbing the devil's nose in it, not my father's nose, the devil's nose in it, because I'm helping other people get healed. <laughs> All over the world. You'll never know, Joyce Meyer, how many people saw that video. And how many people have been touched by it? It's the kingdom. It's redemption of the kingdom. And here we are. We're probably never going to be Joyce Meyer, right? That's okay. We're us. We can be effective in the ministry of reconciliation to people by knowing the word, loving him, loving his spirit, saying, Lord, I want to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And whatever peace I can bring to help somebody get closer to you and get whole from this kind of trauma, I want to be involved in that. And it helps, you know, when you do have people around you that want to help also, that you can hand it off to, right? You got a whole team of people here that want to help. All right, so this is Paula Sanford talking now. I know what time it is, 8.17. Paula Sanford's talking to the wife. And she's saying, can you tell me what you've been through and can you share what you have felt? This is just, again, a shortened version of it. Paula says, I won't elaborate on her words, but rather trust that the Lord will enable the reader to empathize in the simplicity and straightforwardness of her testimony. She said so poetically that I put it here in free verse form. This is what Linda, the wife, said. When I found out what Bill had done, I felt like I was caught in a complicated web. It was so unbelievable, so tremendously big, I couldn't comprehend it. I was in shock, okay? So now the shell shock is the wife. I went through the motions of doing what I knew I had to do. I put him out. At first, I thought Bill's sin is against Karen, not me. And this is a process that we go through. There's this rationalization process we've got. We're forced to deal with things that we never would have wanted to have to think about. And that's one thing that would be easy for somebody to say. But several weeks later, Linda says, reality sank in. The sick lies that he told me and the deception, it all hit me like a brick. Trust was shattered. The past six years have been a lie, and I was angry. Is that okay? You bet. Is it necessary? You bet. Anger, if you don't express it, doesn't go away, does it? No. That doesn't mean you hurt people, but you talk to people and you express. That's what I meant when I said let people vent. Don't be so quick to say, oh, if you would only do this. Huh? You don't know what they're going through. Let them talk. Give them the word. Give them counsel. Cry with those who cry. It's okay. You don't need an answer in this minute. Sometimes the crying will be exactly what they need. She was angry and Paula was there to help counsel her. And she says, look, absolutely everything in my life was shaken to the roots and had to be built up again. Moral structures and everything, especially since I hadn't really resolved my own individuation before I was married. Can I stay there for a second? Right? You remember individuation? We were talking about basic trust. It's it's maturing to the point where you're secure. Well, I believe it's in the four-pager that I gave you. She went for counseling, and the counselor started to try to seduce her. It's unbelievable, the domino effect of the devil. And, well, again, I just have to be careful that I don't start editorializing here. Be careful. Be in a healthy body of believers. Have an accountability group. If you start to see weaknesses pop it up, deal with it. Get to it quickly. Don't allow it to fester. That's what she meant. All of a sudden now, my own identification is being challenged. I'm a failure. I allow my husband to abuse my daughter. I'm a horrible mother. I go to this counselor, and he's saying all the right things. It's like the devil talking through the counselor. And she was tempted. And she admits it and like, wait a minute, no, 
exactly opposite of what I need right now. Let's not compound the problem, right? But man, to take advantage of vulnerable people like that, really like a special place in hell, you would think. But we got to pray for that guy too. <laughs> right. So it says, for a while, my boys were putting a lot of pressure on me and Bill. I'm sorry, a lot of pressure on Bill and me to kiss and make up. Joey, the younger boy, is still like that when they're having this conversation. But Matt, the older one, is 13. She says, Matt understands. Now, Matt's 13. You think he really understands? Well, he understands more than his eight-year-old brother. But, man, what did we call this when a young child is being forced to take on more adult responsibility? Do you remember? Parental inversion. Is it, is it Matt's fault? Does he have any option? <laughs> no. But should we help him identify it when he comes to King of Kings? You bet. Because he's carrying more burden now than he has to. He can let it go. So hopefully you're starting to see how these things connect together, right? Matt did not ask for this hand to be dealt to him, did he? No. Joey's younger. This is the mom talking. And he just loves his daddy. And he can't understand why mommy doesn't love daddy. He's eight. Doesn't get it. So she says, I've been in a bind. I could tell the boys the truth about their father and destroy the image that I'm the bad guy. Imagine that. The mom's being blamed by the kids that she's not forgiven the father. Complicated web, isn't it? She says, I can forgive Bill, but I can't be a wife to him again. Trust and respect are gone. Matt, the older 13-year-old, wanted to tell Paula on his own. He wanted to tell Paula because if it would help some other kid, I want to talk to you. Pretty mature for a 13-year-old, huh? But he wanted her to ask specific questions instead of him just giving a narrative. So Paula's first question, what was your reaction when you first heard about what your dad had done? This is Matt. I didn't believe it. I said, I don't care. My dad would, wouldn't have done anything like that. OK, that's denial. That's a normal reaction that any of us would feel. What made you believe it? And there's this kid, 13, the evidence. The separation, the court, and then he confessed. Your whole world is spinning out. How did it make you feel, Matt? Like glass, shattered. Respect, dependability, be saying shattered. But it didn't even seem real. More like a nightmare that you want to wake up from. Anybody else here ever thought that thought? <laughs> That's what trauma is like, right? It's like, this cannot be happening. Please wake me up and tell me this is a nightmare. Not a nightmare, it's really happening. And how did you feel, this is Paul again, when he had to go to jail? Sorry for him, that he wouldn't have a life, no freedom, no fun. Do you believe the jail will do him any good? Yeah, maybe it'll make him grow up. How's that for a 13 year old? Give him time to think, help him separate fact from fantasy. He has to go to a counselor. What's the most important message that you'd like to send to your dad? That I'll always love him no matter what. Right? Talk about the resilience of a child. And uh, you get one dad. This is my dad. I'm going to try to make it work because I want to make it work. I don't get another one. You might get a stepdad. You know, I, I don't mean to be harsh about it. I'm just saying. Everything in you wants to try to make that work. What's the best wish, Paula said, that you can make for him, the most important prayer that you could say for him, that he would grow up? Sometimes you're awfully angry, Matt. Who are you angry with? My dad. Are you angry at Karen? That's his sister. No, she didn't do anything. Dad did it to her. Are you angry with mom? Well, you know, you get angry with moms. He laughed. But I'm not angry with, with her about, you know, I don't blame her. Matt, you've had trouble sleeping. Why is that? I keep thinking about my dad, about the things I'd like to do with him. Depth charge. That's a rough one, man. That's a rough one. 
that could put a scar in this kid to turn off and then go to inner vows. Hearts of stone, inner vows. I trusted somebody, they let me down, I'm not opening up to anybody again, this hurts too much. Bad mistake, easy to happen. Inner vow, I'm never letting anybody get close to me again. Hurts too much, yeah, but you're also denying yourself the crucial part of life. We're designed by God to be interconnected and interdependent on each other and need each other. We need to be in corporate connection with each other. Ah, it's like every class is coming to a head in this one story, right? Do you worry about how other people feel about your dad? Yeah, I don't want him to lose friends. I don't want people not to like him or think he's a weirdo. How's your brother Joey doing? He thinks the judge was mean to put dad in jail. He just wants to be with his dad, with our dad. Look at this one. Does Joey kind of look to you as a dad now? I am his dad. Parental inversion. 13 years old. Who would ask for this? Nobody. Do we have the ability to survive it? Yeah. Can we probably be given tools to help us cope with it now as adults? Absolutely. Fill in the blank on whatever the issue is. And then this is Paula saying, I watched Big Brother, that's Matt, in operation one day not long ago. He was supervising the writing of Joey's letter to his dad in prison. Joey sat there with a pencil poised, staring off into space. And Matt tried to hurry him, and Joey objected and said, I'm thinking. So Matt says, you don't have to think. Just write, dear dad, I love you. So Joey started, wrote a word or two, and then spaced out again. Matt says, come on, Joey, keep going, keep going. Finally, Joey's letter was complete. Dear dad, I love you. I'm sad for you. Right? That's eight years old. This is a family moving ahead in the Lord's healing process. This is Paula talking now. And again, it's just a summary. You got the four-page version of it here. And you know, like, this is the deal. Like, we have to move ahead. You can't choose to stay locked down and shut down. We have to decide. I'm getting up and I'm moving ahead. It might not feel like light years of progress at any given time, but I'm not staying stuck. God loves me too much. No matter what the facts of the circumstances are, he loves me too much to say that staying shut down and locked down could be the final answer. That's not the final answer. And if there's any way we can help you. And that's why coming up for prayer is so valuable. And I'll be honest, this is why corporate worship is really valuable. There's something about being in the atmosphere when people are worshiping God together that pulls off layers off of us and allows us just to forget about time for a little while and just get lost in that worship for a minute. And God does something beyond our brain into our spirit, man. I really believe it's part of our altar. And I, and I really believe it's the power of our words when we're singing it all out loud together you know, in sync with each other and all saying the same thing we said Sunday, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. You sing that alone, it's powerful, but a hundred people singing it all together, it does something. Come, let us magnify the Lord together. Magnify him with me. Let us exalt his name together. It empowers your altar time and say, you know what, devil, who the heck do you think you're lying to? I'm not going to listen to your lies anymore. Do I have a mess on my hands? Yeah. You know, I'm not going to deny that fact, but I don't. Also, I'm not going to deny the fact that I have a God who knows how to untangle messes. <laughs> Big time, as Donald Trump would say. Big time. We got the big time God, amen? All right, so they're moving forward. That's what she said. This family is moving ahead in the Lord's healing process. Despite substantial difficulties, new life is opening beautifully before them. They have made choices to forgive and to love unconditionally. Woo! There's a little bit more in there that you can read if you want. The Lord has caused those repeated choices to become a reality that opens doors to continued healing and blessing. All right, so on the handout I gave you that you looked at Einstein on one side, there's a prayer on the other side. So we should stand up and pray together, okay? I know it's 8.32, so. I landed the plane. We're waiting at the gate. 
This is an important prayer, okay? So the way it's written is as if you were speaking to somebody and you were interceding on behalf of somebody who had been abused, okay? So it's not in the first person. We're not praying for ourselves here. It's as if you were speaking over somebody else. Obviously, you can keep this and say it over yourself. But the same principle applies. So let's just say it's um, Karen, because Karen's a girl in that story that I read, okay? She was the one that had been abused. Ready? A prayer to heal victims. Lord Jesus, Karen has been sinned against. I ask you to communicate to her heart that it was not her fault. A bad thing has happened, but she's not a bad person. She did not make the abuser hurt her. He did all, that all on his own. Jesus, speak the truth to her heart. Help her know that you really do love her with a clean, non-abusive love. You have not rejected or abandoned her. Cause the pure living water of your presence to flow over her at a pace that is respectful of her. And Jesus, I thank you that you know just how close you can come to Karen without frightening her. I thank you that you did not violate her boundaries. Wash her clean inside and out. Wash away the defilement with wave after wave of your love. Wash away the smells, the sounds, and the touch sensations. Clothe her in your truth and righteousness. Cause her conscience to be clear. Separate her spirit, Lord, from the one who abused, and then they mentioned spiritual adultery, which we'll be covering in this class, soul ties, which I already mentioned, right? All right, back to Father. This has so shattered her trust, it's difficult to trust or believe anyone. Together, we ask you to begin the process of rebuilding that broken trust. The practice ways that do not lead to life, Lord, we bring to you. And this is where you would work with that person, go through the bitter root judgments that might have been formed. These ways have been hurtful to her and others. So we ask you to deal with them, Lord. Minister to the fear, loneliness, weariness, confusion, and anger. Lift it all out, Jesus, and replace it with your comfort that goes deep into the bones. We give you the anger at her father, in this case, for not protecting, or could have been her mother, for not believing. Replace it with your peace and truth of who she really is in your eyes. Can we say that again? Replace it with your peace and truth of who she really is in your eyes. Not the shame-filled person. Not the defiled person. Not the person whose innocence can never be restored again. Those are all lies from the devil, right? So replace with your peace and the truth of who she really is in your eyes. All right, let's do it. May she come to know her identity as your cherished child. Cause the eyes of her spirit to see you, to see the pride in your eyes that she has come to you, to see your delight in her presence. Show her those people in her life who are worthy of trust. Bring comfort to the bruised and broken places. Bring healing to her relationship with you and with the others in her life that have been wounded. Wrap her up in your glory as a protection. Hide her from the powers of darkness. Together we forgive her for having responded physically and forgive her for ways she has judged, condemned, or looked down on her body. Lord, you made us to respond. Help her spirit to know you do not condemn her. It is not her body's fault. It was made that way. It was a natural response. Her no was not listened to. Her person and her boundaries were not respected. Lift off the guilt. May your glory continue to heal her. May it hide her and be a protection for her. Thank you, Jesus, that you do care. I just want to pray over you guys, okay? Lord, we thank you for the sensitivity of what we just read, how we are really fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are delicate, intricate treasures Whatever has been unwound and confused in our lives, you have the ability to pull that all back together again. 
you have the ability to make that crooked way straight, to take down the hills and obstacles and to fill in those valleys where we have felt lacking in certain areas and strengths. We just say, Lord, you knew who we were when we were formed in our mother's womb. There was a blueprint for our lives. And your word says we know the plans that you have for us. They're plans to succeed and to prosper. You have good plans for us. The enemy's plan may have won for part of our lives, but you win, Lord. We declare you are the champion, the dread champion that wins over our lives. And you have made us to be more than conquerors. So we receive that mantle now to overcome the things that have hurt us in our lives, not on our own strength but through your power working through us, through the truth of the word of God, canceling out the lies, and through the power of the body of Christ. As we operate together, you said, the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. Lord, we thank you for people we can trust, for people that have no agenda other than to want to help us grow in who we are and move on and flourish into who you truly called us to be. None of us are without problems in our lives. And you're ready and, and able to heal all of us of whatever that issue is and, and launch us into that next phase of our lives to be more effective ministers for you. I just speak life and health over everybody here, everybody listening. However that combination works to form that healing pattern in our lives, we receive it by faith now. And thank him, just thank him for it. Lord, we thank you by faith that you are moving me towards my healing. Say it louder. You are moving me towards my healing. By faith, I receive it. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. And you don't have to run out of here, okay? We have people to pray. So if you feel so led and you'd like us to agree with you in prayer, we're not going anywhere. Just please, if you would, just form a, a, a line up the aisle there. And uh, we'll, we'll have teams up here in the front. Bless you all. We love you.